landed on the moon, but now the government shutdown has put the astronauts on their duffs. NASA sitting it out for a look beyond the news. Here now is Liz Trotta's Sunday commentary. Some of the smartest people who work for our government seem to be the most expendable. They work at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, where 97% of the workforce, or about 18,000 people, have been furloughed since October 1st. That day, incidentally, marked the space agency's 55th birthday. By last week, some of the expendable brainy employees were on a picket line at the NASA Ames Research Center in California. They were demanding to get back to our data. Others inquired if there were jobs on other planets. The government shutdown, anything but partial if you work for NASA, is so desperate in Houston, a local movie house is offering laid-off workers free tickets to see Gravity. That's the film in which another of Hollywood's women warriors triumphs over certain death with continuous heavy breathing and a really bad script. Gravity should be renamed Zero Gravity. As the shutdown went into effect, NASA wiped its website to the particular disappointment of kids all over the world hooked on space. The official memo of the closure, however, assured us that they're not really laying off the really essential personnel, those who are vital to the protection of people and property. Should an emergency arise, another 1,500 workers are on call. That must be comforting news to the six astronauts manning the International Space Station. They can still talk to Mission Control, even if it's only to say, we have a problem. The two Americans aboard, Mike Hopkins and Karen Nyberg, are still tweeting, mostly about the view. Beautiful storms over Ghana, and love this cloud, and Chicago looks amazing at night. Insipid dialogue is one thing the movie got right. The shutdown has delayed several of NASA's projects, except for MAVEN, another mission to Mars set for a liftoff on November 18th. If they don't launch MAVEN during the window when Mars and Earth are aligned, then the mission probably wouldn't fly until 2016. The purpose of this unmanned flight is to relay signals to Earth from the two rovers, curiosity and opportunity that continue to inch doggedly along the rocky red surface. If this isn't enough hardware to track, the Juno spacecraft, launched in 2011 for a rendezvous with Jupiter, got a gravity boost as it passed Earth on October 9th. A planetary scientist at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio told Scientific American, quote, the spacecraft is going to fly by whether Congress agrees to work together or not, close quote. So all is not lost, except that in an eerie coincidence of time and space, Scott Carpenter died last week. Commander Carpenter flew into the history books as one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts and the second American to orbit the Earth. He flew three orbits in space back in 1962 on a white-knuckle ride that for 39 minutes led the world, and even Walter Cronkite, to suspect he had perished during reentry. Carpenter epitomized the test pilot code, confident, certain, bold, and optimistic, the polar opposite of what we see in the halls of Washington. Writing in his memoir, he dismissed the perilous moments of his flight with the same kind of pure logic that all pioneers possess. Some saw it as a dicey flight, but, says Carpenter, at the time, I didn't see it that way. First, I was trained to avoid any intellectual comprehension of disaster, dwelling on a potential danger or imagining what might happen. I was too busy with the tasks at hand. If the younger generation is looking for a definition of cool, there it is. No whining, just do it. More to the point, the grown men of Washington politics would do well to consider astronaut Carpenter's intellectual comprehension of disaster. It's still called having the right stuff. Take care, everybody. Take care.